Rob Stutzman, former Deputy Chief of Staff for Communications to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Stephen Maviglio, former Press Secretary for Governor Gray Davis, have been following political campaigns for many decades. They will discuss the history of the recall process, the origins of this year's recall effort, polling, messaging, finances, and what the result of the Newsom recall process means for California and the nation. Now here are Rob and Stephen. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thanks for having us back. Uh, many of you might have seen us do the uh, debriefing and demystifying of some of the ballot initiatives uh, last year. Uh, bad news, there's 44 filed for 2022, so we might be back to explain those for you once again. Uh, but for this, we're gonna be talking about the California recall. Uh, as you know, the forum puts together these um, calendars early in the year and boy, it seemed at the time that this would be right about the time the election was going to happen. So uh, we we're only off by two months, but we'll explain that a little bit too. Um, so we'll just give you a little bit of background about the recall, the history of the recall, some of the inside game of the recall. We'll uh, have a few war stories from our personal experiences uh, during the recall of 2003. Uh, we were on opposite sides back then. And uh, give you a little insight about where the recall process might be heading. Uh, Rob, you want to say a few words? Just uh, a good afternoon, everyone. It is good to be with you again. Enjoy my longtime friend. Hopefully you, hopefully you will all find this interesting and maybe you'll learn something. Look forward to the next hour. All right, so let's get underway. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. And uh, let's, Chris, let's move on to our first slide just to give a little bit of history. So the recall is one of the tools that Californians have. We have a lot of power as voters compared to other states. Um, we're one of 19 states that allow recalls. We have some of the longest history of recalls. It was first started on the city level in Los Angeles in 1903. And it went statewide in 1913. So we have a little over a century of recall history and we've seen a lot of different things during that time. Uh, we also have ballot referendums where you can overturn the law of a legislature. And we also have citizen initiatives uh, that are on the ballot, as we're painfully aware, every other year to, to actually enact laws directly by voters. So the, the recall is just another one of those tools. Um, next slide, Chris. And as you can see, you know, across America, it's very rare. In fact, there's only been four where they actually went to the ballot and only one where it actually succeeded in California and one in the state of North Dakota where poor Lynn Frazier got elected and uh, there was a fight over the Bank of North Dakota, if you can believe that as a reason. And he was recalled. Uh, good news for Governor Frazier, he went on to the US Senate and served for almost 20 years. So he had a successful life after the recall. Uh, and. Uh, and you can see Scott Walker in Wisconsin. Rob, do you want to talk about that one for a sec? Yeah, you may recall this is, re so really think of there being three recalls in, in modern American history of, of governors. And uh, they've all happened in the last, uh, within the last 18 years. Walker is the example of a Republican that was attempted to be recalled really by an effort backed by, by labor unions. And that recall broke out into, in a very closely divided state, broke out into a real, you know, business and Republican versus labor and Democrat oriented recall, which Walker did survive and actually went on to uh, be reelected one more time. Okay, next slide, Chris. So as, as little as we've seen success or actually in this century, um, a lot of aggressive recalls, you know, this is something that's not new, I mean, Every governor in the last 60 years has had some kind of recall petition filed against him. Um, only a couple, only one was successful, but they, they're filed on a regular basis. Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor Brown had six or seven. Gavin Newsom had, I think, six before this one was successful or including this one. And you also see him at the state level. There was a hotly debated uh, recall of a state senator in Orange County. A couple of years ago, Josh Newman, uh, he's back in the Senate having gotten elected. Um, there was a, an attempt to uh, recall a Republican state senator, Jeff Denham, from a little south of here a few years ago, and he held off that. Um, but for governors, there's um, 
you know, it's, it's a rare thing. And only 11 recalls and all those that you see on the slide there actually have been successful. So it, it's, a, it's a tool, but there's a lot to it. Rob, if you you know, I was going to add the, the other time we've seen recalls in somewhat recent history, last uh, 30, 40 years, was in the night after the 1994 elections, the Republicans actually had a majority in the state assembly, which would have deposed Willie Brown from his position as the speaker of the assembly. Uh, but Sly Willie had a couple of those Republicans in his back pocket, and he was able to get them to defect and kept uh, Democrats in power in that chamber for a year until Republicans could run recall elections uh, to, remo <laughs> to remove the traitorous Republicans. So it's another example of how the tool's been used in more recent California political history. Yep. Next slide. So, uh, you know, as Rob just said, it's used as a, a political tool. Uh, as this cartoon illustrates in this particular case, it's Republicans that went after Gavin Newsom, just as they did with Gray Davis. Um, but it's not something, as we just pointed out, with the state Senate race and, and assembly races, that's exclusive to Republicans toppling Democrats who have the majority reservations in party registration. It goes the other way around. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword for sure in the game of politics. Rob? Any? Well, I'd agree. In fact, it, it can really backfire, it, as it may have done in this case with Newsom. We'll see. We'll talk about what lies ahead this, this coming next year with his regularly scheduled election. But the aforementioned uh, recall of, of uh, Senator Denham that Steve was talking about, you know, he was able to beat, beat that back. Senator Mike Machado was able to beat back similar, you know, recalls about a decade before that down the Central Valley. And they really emerged stronger politically than they did going into it. Yeah. Okay, so let's go down memory lane for a quick minute here. We're going to show you a very short clip from an excellent documentary on the 2000 uh, recall, uh, 2003 recall of Governor Davis and Crifish. If you would play that, that would be great. The recall of Gray Davis was the largest recall election in American history. It was Hollywood. The world was in California then. What this is turning into is a first-class carnival. The race to replace Davis is already taking on a circus-like atmosphere. Yeah! And there's a guy who dressed like a clown. There's a guy who called himself the bump hunter, and then there's a porn star. Mary Carey, the porn star. Yep, she was in there too. I had big boobs, and I was always balancing them, you know? We had Ariana Huffington. We had Arnold. Are we going to be united or are we going to be divided? See Arnold Schwarzenegger, huh? Well, you ever seen the movie uh, Twins? I guess I'm Danny DeVito. <laughs> this recall is just a bunch of sour grapes by a bunch of losers. Everybody was out there. It was like the clown car pulled up in the circus and everybody popped out, including the big strong man. Okay, so I always get a little PTSD when I start talking about the 2003 <laughs> recall, but it was really a phenomenon. Big differences, though, between now and then, and I, I don't think the media really pointed them out uh, often enough. Uh, first of all, I, you know, Gray Davis was a Democrat, but he was not particularly popular among all voters, that's for sure, but also in his own party he had a lot of troubles. He was often at odds with the state Senate President John Burton, often at odds with other members of his own party. He was facing billion dollar budget deficits as compared to surpluses, which meant a lot of popular programs had to be cut and that tended to make a lot of enemies. He had to raise taxes, again, uh, a lot of enemies. Uh, Gavin Newsom didn't have any of those problems. He had a solid democratic party, which we'll talk about in a second. And he's had lots of money to, to dole out around the state and actually literally during this campaign, almost played Santa Claus going around from one city to the next talking about different programs. So there was a lot of differences there. The other major difference was the party registration. At the time, 2003, there was almost parity among Democrats and Republicans in the state in terms of party registration. And now it's almost two to one with Democrats having the advantage. So that had a huge difference. And of course, while we had a number of different candidates on the ballot, which we'll go through in a second, we didn't have any Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> this time around, but we certainly had one last time around. And I'll let Rob talk to you about the recall from his point of view. I think Steve covered the differences very, very well. You know, look, Davis was much more unpopular than Newsom was. Uh, 
uh, or, or is even at this point. The, the other thing is just how people feel about the state in general. You know, you'll you'll see this in the national polling too. The wrong, is the state or the country on the wrong track or the right track? In politics, we love this wrong track, right track number uh, because it 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 wraps up the sentiment, a mood of the electorate, which is important. And when that wrong track gets too high, it's bad news for incumbents, no matter what their party. The wrong track in California right now just never really got that high. Uh, in fact, coming out of the recall and some you know, more recent polling, we've seen the right track bump back up. So that it was just a very, very different political environment. And then the other two keys are what, you know, really what Steve mentioned, there was no Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, and that's just this. This has become so much more of a Democrat state, even though Democrats did have a majority or plurality, I should say, in know, three, you know, that advantage has uh, has really tripled numerically the gap they have over Republicans in those 18 years. So just very, very difficult for Republican uh, Republicans to be able to achieve statewide success. So, Chris, let's go to the next slide and we'll show you a few polling slides as we, we started the recall. And, and this is a really important one. Uh, Gray Davis's numbers were in the high 20s in terms of approval. But if you look at Gavin Newsom, he has been consistently above 50 percent. And that's a good place to be when you're in politics. And you can see right through the whole year that number stayed pretty tight, 56, 57 percent. So even though there's different numbers on would you recall him or not, his overall approving approval rating never really fell below the 50% mark, which is huge for consultants like us to look at an election like this. Uh, next one. So this was the first early poll about should the governor be recalled? And even then, uh, even the heat of the moment back then, or so we thought, the it was a 50-50 proposition. There was a lot of undecided votes. So when you're a consultant, you look at this number, 40% is usually the level you don't want to go below, but this was close. It was in the margin of error. So there were glimmers of hope along a lot of people nationally and in California that the governor actually could get recall. And one of the reasons was the situation with COVID at the time. You can move to the next slide. This was where Newsom was vulnerable at the time. Uh, there was a lot of shutdowns going on, a lot of mixed signals about what he was gonna do. And the public really was not in his corner when it came to COVID at this point in time. And that left him a little more vulnerable than you might've thought. It's also worth pointing out, I think, Steve, that you know at that time, shots were just beginning to really get into people's arms. And so the anxiety about COVID uh, was was high, probably the highest at, at any point during this calendar year. Right. And then the next one. This is the poll that Rob was talking about before. This is the one, as Rob said, the one that as consultants we look at the most often. It's like right now, uh, when you look at the American right track, wrong track for the whole country, we're, we're almost the other way around, and that's hurting Democrats. But right now, there was wind at Gavin Newsom's back, way back in March, in terms of how everybody thought the overall state of the state was, was going. And it's a very high number. 57% is a pretty high number. OK, next slide. Talk a little bit about the process. Rob, do you want to kick this one off a little bit? Yeah, so the process on qualifying a, a recall um, is it's a lot of signatures because California is large, but it's actually the, lar the smallest threshold of signatures uh, of any state in the country. It's probably the reason we didn't see recalls in other states is it just, it's just a little more difficult there. So the 2.1 million signatures um, that were gathered to make sure there was enough valid signatures of the almost the 1.5 that were necessary. Uh, really got uh, really wind into its sales uh, having to do with COVID. But you'll see that the petition, and as Steve mentioned, there's always almost an active petition of recall against the sitting governor, all has to do with issues uh, that have nothing to do with COVID, but look like more of the, uh, you know, an agenda at a California Republican Assembly uh, auxiliary uh, meeting. So very conservative reasons as to, you know, because those were the conservative activists that started this recall. But something happened that 
put wind into the sails, and that would have been the infamous dinner at the uh, French Laundry in Yountville. Yeah, and when you look at this, you know, largely this was a volunteer effort for many, many months. And one of the things, one of the major factors that kept us going was a court decision that allowed them to, to extend the time to collect signatures because of COVID. Had they not gotten that, it is, I think, unlikely that would have happened. In addition, they got a large check. They started raising some big money that paid some paid signature gatherers, real professionals, to, to get this to really take off. And that combination was pretty lethal. But when you look at the reasons for the recall and the stated recall position, they were very different from one, most of the things that were just discussed in the actual campaign. Uh, Orrin Heatley is a very conservative Republican. Um, the, he had a lot of anti-immigration statements that the Newsom campaign ended up using. Uh, and the agenda here of homelessness, sanctuary state, death penalty, water use, you know, these were things that weren't on the tip of the tongue for most voters at that time. Nonetheless, they qualified. So how were they supposed to win this? Rob, uh, let's go to the next slide and, and talk about what they needed to do. So what the, by the, so when we say the Republicans, as we just we talked about, it, it really wasn't the California Republican Party that started this. It was activists this, led by this Mr. Heatley uh, that had the petition that was active. Uh, then consultants and the state Republican Party came in and worked with them in order to use their petition uh, petition to get the signatures for the recall. So what the Republican Party needed or any challenger to Newsom needed to have happen was uh, for those, those approval ratings to go below 50%. And as Steve indicated, they never did, uh, which is, by the way, is why we never saw a Democrat run. That was one of the other differences we, we glossed over from the 03 recall is there was a prominent Democrat, Lieutenant Governor Cruz Bustamante, that ran in 03. It was really important to the Newsom campaign that no prominent Democrat run. So there was no alternative for Democrats. And they were able to succeed in that because his performance never, his performance never dropped. The Republicans then also um, were eager to move the focus on to uh, homelessness uh, and ri rising crime, which is what their candidates did talk quite a bit about, especially over the summer, once we were in a better COVID situation there briefly before the Delta variant wave. And then they desperately tried to, to uh, deflect Donald Trump. And interestingly, you know, Trump never really waded into this until the, you know, the last days of the recall, uh, when he raised, you know, allegations of potential voter fraud. Trump stayed away from this for the most part, because I think he saw he'd be associated with a likely, a likely loss. So what Republicans needed to have happen just didn't happen. Uh, you know, COVID got a little better over the summer. Once people were vaccinated and the governor was pushing mandates, turns out a majority of voters were actually for the mandates because they had been vaccinated. And Republicans found themselves, the Republican candidates, and just the mood of the electorate, found themselves ironically on the wrong end of the COVID argument that nine months prior had really helped propel them into qualifying the recall. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And next slide, please. So for the Democrats, this was pretty simple. Um, the first thing, as Rob just mentioned, was keeping another Democrat out of the race. As I mentioned earlier, Gray Davis had a lot of problems with his own party. Newsom really never had that. He handily won the primary when he ran for governor. There really weren't a lot of buzzards circling around him, uh, despite the fact that not everybody loved him, but his approval numbers were still high. And trust me, a lot of Democrats polled to see if they should run against them. And they found the answer was, you know what? You'll not win <laughs> if you run against the incumbent governor with all the powers of an incumbent governor. So the governor quickly consolidated his Democratic base he pulled the national party into it. You may have remembered some advertising from Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and a lot of other national Democrats. He made sure the California Democratic Party, which is considerably stronger than the California Republican Party, was fully behind him. Um, their strategy was to keep somebody else out as a replacement candidate on the other side of the ballot. Remember, there were two questions. There was a yes, no, and a recall, and then you got to vote for somebody else. And if he could keep a prominent Democrat out of the other side of the question, 
that allowed him to focus just on the simple message of vote no. In fact, they ended up saying vote no and go to make sure Republicans didn't even, Democrats didn't even think about the other side of the ballot. They also framed this from the get-go as stop the Republican recall. Uh, when there's two times as many Democrats as Republicans in the state, that's a very smart strategy because you're trying to make this look as partisan as possible. And then fortunately for him, the people that filed the recall petition were very partisan and they had close links or links to Donald Trump. So the Democrats were, were wise to try to make this about Donald Trump and about national Republicans. This is a state where you know, Trump lost by millions and millions and millions of votes. So their math was the right call to keep as many Democrats in their camp and try to consolidate the losses from Republicans and independents. At the time, there was a lot of worry though among Democrats about enthusiasm. Uh, people, you know, 52% approval for Newsom is good, but it's not great. There was a lot of worry that Republicans were all excited to get him out because they disliked him so much, but Democrats were, eh, you know, he's all right. Well, it didn't turn out to be that way as we'll go at the end. And, to show you the percentage of the ballots that came in from both parties, but that was the thinking at the time early on. So it was the goal of Democrats to excite Democrats to get out of the polls. We didn't really see that in Virginia, which Rob will gloat about later on in the conversation today, but uh, it was a big deal at the time. So then we had that second part of the ballot. So let's go to the next slide. And we had quite a cast of characters running against Gavin Newsom. Um, not the caliber of Arnold Schwarzenegger, for sure. Uh, let's go through them pretty quickly. First slide, and, and Rob, you can take the lead on the Republicans. Yeah, Kate, Caitlyn Jenner uh, came into the race with great fanfare, uh, reality TV star, um, obviously well-known and lauded nationally for her transgender uh, leadership. And then, of course, uh, was a, an Olympian hero in, in the in the 70s. So very, very well known, uh, but really came in with a thud. Uh, it was clear from the first couple interviews that she, she really wasn't equipped with a, a knowledge base or the skills to suggest that she could govern the largest state in the nation. And uh, the campaign pretty much faded, somewhat aided by the fact that she went to Australia to fulfill an obligation on a reality TV show down under. Yeah, and she also didn't participate in any of the debates. Um, she had an adverse relationship with the California press corps. She did a couple national shows to kick off her campaign, but didn't meet with California reporters. The website was completely blank of any kind of policy positions. But the media sort of liked this story in the wake of Schwarzenegger as she was a celebrity. And they sort of fell for it in the beginning, but as it proved to be a nothing burger as the, the days and months went on, they quickly moved on. Next candidate. So Kevin Faulkner, former mayor of San Diego, uh, had worked in the Pete Wilson administration, uh, truly a moderate Republican who had been elected twice citywide in a city that has Democrat plurality. Uh, worked with a Democrat majority city council to do a lot of things in San Diego that are that are pretty well thought of. So the last successful big city Republican mayor in California was what he was uh, coming off of, of, of doing. His plan was to run next year, which he still may do, but then the recall came along and you know decided he couldn't pass on it, that it should be a field that he enters into. Ultimately, though, uh, Kevin got crowded out when, as, we'll, as we go through the rest of these candidates, we'll talk about this dynamic, the field essentially began to act like a Republican primary, where everyone was running far to the right, especially since Larry Elder, who's to come, uh, got into the field, and uh, he, was, he was eclipsed and ran, I want to say he ran fourth, Steve, overall, I think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, Mayor Faulkner, I think, was the candidate the Democrats feared the most because he was the most moderate and he actually had gotten some things done with a supermajority Democratic City Council in San Diego. Uh, he was the most moderate and had the most appeal. But as Rob just said, uh, when it became a battle among Republicans, moderate Republicans don't fare too well uh, nationally and in California these days. And he became a victim of his own success in 
The Democrats also went after him because he had a picture famously standing behind Donald Trump in the Oval Office. So they were able to connect those dots quickly for many voters who didn't know anything about him and who were looking for a possible moderate alternative to Gavin Newsom. Uh, next one, please. John Cox. So John Cox was the Republican in the runoff against Gavin Newsom, of course, in 2018. Uh, John's a businessman that uh, has never held office. Uh, had been, you know, he, he's run though many times, including uh, running for president once uh, in the New Hampshire primary. So uh, he, <laughs> you can see him there with the bear. Uh, in order to try to stand out, uh, he funded uh, a, camp, um, a campaign ad uh, that had him with a bear. And uh, the idea was is that uh, John Cox was beastly and just the gentle beast that California needed to fix its, uh, its ails. So look, when you do ads like this, what you're trying to do is, is be memorable. Um, as I say, moon the crowd and they're going to remember who you are. Uh, and that's what, that's what Cox tried to do. And it, it uh, didn't have much effect and in some ways may have backfired. Um, I think he was probably largely thought of as a caricature um, after this ad campaign. Yeah. And his candidacy sort of fed another Newsom narrative that, you know, going back to the clown car clip from early on in our presentation that, you know, this whole, Recall was a circus, and there you had a, a bear in the first ring. And so the media had a lot of fun with this, uh, rather than putting him on the map. I mean, he got a lot of attention, but not the kind of good attention you want as a candidate. Uh, and he was a self-styled business person, lots of money, self-funded candidate. Um, but the Democrats were not worried at all about John Cox since Newsom had handily beaten him in the gubernatorial election just a few months prior to that, essentially. You know, Steve, those ads reminded me, uh, we're probably, well, you and I and probably most people watching remember the Cal Worthington ads, uh, the used car dealer who always would appear with a, a wild animal, Cal Worthington and his dog Spot, as the uh, jingle would go. Uh, this, to me, had a heavy Cal Worthington vibe uh, when yeah. I saw that ad. <laughs> and I, I think it came from the same ad maker that made Demon Sheep for Carly Fiorina, too. So That's correct. Yeah. Mr. Davis has a thing for animals. Let's just put it that way. Okay, next one. Kevin Kiley. So Kevin's a, a young conservative assemblyman from uh, South Placer County, Rockland area. Uh, he, he's ambitious, wants to, I think, run for higher office uh, in his career. And he's an example of the free ride that was available to some of these candidates to run. So he's a sitting assemblyman and was able to run for governor uh, at no risk of giving up his his seat. Uh, now, next year, I would think he's not going to run for governor because if he fails, he then would be out of the legislature. So, uh, you know, Kevin, I think cleverly used this as an opportunity to promote himself, build some name identification and more of a more of a political network, a network of donors beyond just his assembly seat. Yeah, and I think his goal, as Russ pointed out, was just to try to make a name for himself, to raise his profile. You know, you're a Republican assembly member. You're not getting a lot of publicity for doing anything. Uh, he seems to have a, a real personal dislike of the governor. He wrote a book about how bad the governor was. I think maybe he was trying to fuel some book sales with this run. Um, but he's back in the assembly, uh, depending on how his district gets carved up in the next few weeks. Uh, we'll see what his political future might be like, but probably not probably going to be a name you're going to hear about in the future. Next one. It's so Larry Elder. Larry Elder was the game changer. So a longtime talk radio host, primarily in Southern California, but he's syndicated. So he has some following around the state, but also a bit around the country. So Elder got into this race at the very last moment. In fact, his paperwork wasn't quite in order. Um, and he was not put on the ballot by the Secretary of State. He went to court and the judge agreed that the requirement that he uh, release his tax returns um, was unconstitutional, wasn't legal, and put him back on the ballot. So that's how close he came to never even appearing on the ballot. 
But once Elder was put on the ballot and began a, a campaign, he was able to raise money from small uh, donors, uh, small dollar donors at great volume because he had the most notoriety of anyone running. And then uh, he fit exactly the frame that Gavin Newsom was looking for. As Steve had talked about earlier, the strategy was to build this as the Republican recall um, associated with Trump type candidates and that really wasn't connecting until Larry Elder came along, became the real front runner of the candidates. And Newsom was able to finish this, finish the race, really running head to head against Larry Elder in terms of what the voters were seeing and how they were feeling it and how the media was covering it. And Elder was just far too conservative and out of step with uh, mainstream California to be able to be a comp competitive candidate. Yeah, and he turned out to be the gift that kept on giving for Gavin Newsom. Uh, during the campaign, he said a lot of outrageous things. He was, for example, was against any kind of minimum wage at a time when people were really hurting in the state. Um, so he just fit perfectly the mold and uh, Newsom people couldn't have been happier when he entered the race because they focused on him. And he quickly became the front runner after just the you know, weeks of his entry because as you saw from the other candidates who just went through, none of them were really appealing to anybody. And he got very high profile recognition from the media. And as a black Republican, again, a very rare thing in California politics, he had got a lot of national attention as well. Um, but it didn't work out for him as we'll see in the results a little bit later on. So let's talk about the actual campaign a little bit now and, and, and how it all unfolded and what happened. Next slide, please. Oh, I forgot. How could I forget? Well, you I guess are? you forgetting this probably is, makes the point. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, the, the Democrats didn't feel the candidate as we talked about. So Kevin filled the void. He was an entrepreneur from Southern California, most notable for his YouTube videos. And his whole shtick was, hey, I'm a Democrat. If God forbid this thing passes, vote for me because I'm a Democrat. Uh, and that was his whole deal. And he went around the state and I think I should double check, but I think he finished my, maybe second of the, the candidates was third. He, he was way up there because he was the only Democrat that ran a real campaign. And, and he, the media sort of was transfixed on him for yeah. him, you know coming out of nowhere. But you know, in 2003, he would have been one of the 400 you never heard of. Right. Yeah, he got on stage for one debate and I think that gave him just enough name ID. And it was in that debate that he proposed building a pipeline from the Mississippi River to California to solve our drought. Right. No, enough said. <laughs> All right, so back to the campaign. Next slide, please. So a lot of different things happened on the way to September. Uh, first was the timetable. There is great discretion in the law about when the election should be set. Ultimately, it's set by the Lieutenant Governor. And you can bet there was a lot of behind the scenes talks about when it would be ideal for the governor. And as we talked about earlier on, COVID was changing pretty rapidly at the time. People were beginning to get their vaccinations. People were lining up for vaccinations. People were feeling optimistic about going outside. The weather was warming, restaurants were opening. People were feeling good. And the thought was the sooner we get this over with, the better. Also, the legislature had been gone for the summer. They couldn't cause any trouble. Um, and there were just a number of other events that seemed to make it advantageous for the Newsom campaign, the Democrats, to set a very early date, which they did in September. Like I said, we thought we'd be talking about the election today here in November, off by two months. The other big thing is that everybody got a ballot. Uh, 2003, that didn't happen. You had to go to the polls. Uh, this is a great advantage for Democrats because there's a lot more Democrats and everybody had one in their mailbox. So it was up to Democrats just to get out there, get out the vote effort, which Democrats and unions in particular are very strong at, and generate the enthusiasm to vote. And they, they ultimately succeeded in that. Uh, the Newsom campaign also had a huge money advantage. One of the things a few people know about recalls is that there's no limits on how much he can give. So he got a number of million dollar contributions from individuals and that really helped him uh, put a lot of ads on the air against a field of people that couldn't afford that. In fact, the highest was $3 million that he received in one contribution. Yeah. And just for context, so the, uh, the limits next year for a governor uh, 
Oh, I haven't checked. It's probably next year around 28,000 or so. That sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. 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 So that was a huge advantage as anybody in politics will tell you though, the person who spends the most money typically wins. Uh, meanwhile, on the Republican side, there was a lot of fighting among their own candidates. Um, Faulkner was going after Elder, Kylie was going after some other people. There was a lot of back and forth among the candidates, which ultimately became noise, but allowed the Newsom campaign just to focus on the yes, no question. Exactly right. The Republicans started behaving, as I'd said earlier, like it was a primary, really trying to get to the right of one another uh, most, most of the time and attacking one another. And once that happened, you're only talking to 25% of the electorate. Yeah. And then lastly, I think the governor had, you know, record surplus. So he went around the state um, peering and giving away money and highlighting programs and not having to cut anything. That's a big, big difference uh, compared to 2003. And I think the Newsom team really used that to their advantage to play up to the different constituencies that he had done good things for in the state budget and also as an incumbent governor. Okay, so let's go back a little to the results and what happened and why. Next slide, please. Uh, the first thing this, I know it's a little hard to see, but what it essentially says is that Democrats and Republicans pretty much reacted just like they did in the gubernatorial election a couple of years beforehand. The number of ballots returned, the number of people voting, the types of people who voted. The only difference was a little more uh, skewed toward older voters. The younger voters really didn't turn out this time like they did in the presidential election, which might be understandable. Um, Donald Trump really got them to the polls. Uh, but otherwise, you know, things were business as usual when it came to the election. Rob? Yeah, I mean, this is what's shocking is that it was essentially percentage-wise proportionally a, a repeat of the of the general election that had transpired just three years earlier, which really made the whole thing feel like an exercise of futility. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let's just go through a few quick polls for you and then we'll get onto our reforms. This is a, the overall, did you wanna keep them or remove them? You can see the, the polling aggregates came close to 50-50 in the middle of the summer, but widened deeply. People started to get serious and Democrats really turned out their get out the vote message and effort. And Larry Elder, I, again, I want to emphasize how important Elder, I think, was to this. Gavin was then able to run against somebody, and that really helped him. Exactly. Next slide. This one shows the similarity in votes between the Newsom gubernatorial race, uh, the presidential race in 2020, and the no on recall. The numbers are almost exactly the same. And that's largely due to Democratic performance and getting the Democrats out to vote. Next slide. Uh, if you can imagine California here, <laughs> you can see it's very typical of the way California votes. The coast is heavily Democratic. The North and some of the inland counties are more Republican and the recall results played almost exactly the same. I think there was one or two counties that voted a little differently than they did in the, in the gubernatorial election, but it's largely the same. Next slide. This just shows that on a different kind of scale. You'll see that the, the counties above and below, how close they were to the actual uh, 2018 vote shared and the recall, they're all very within two or three points of the same exact result in 2018. Next one. Okay, so now what do we do with this mess? Rob, why don't you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, so one of the themes that we heard toward, even towards the end of the recall campaign was that there should be some type of reform uh, to not either make it as simple for recalls to take place or to change the way that the selection of the next uh, candidate, next governor would be if the recall were successful. One of the one of the issues that kept getting raised was that if well, if the you know elder was polling at maybe twenty two percent amongst the candidates, the Newsom campaign was telling Democrats don't vote for any of the candidates, just vote no on the campaign on the on the recall. But if Newsom had actually been recalled, you had the prospect of the next governor at least for the next year having been a, voted for by a very small proportion 
of the state. And that, that started raising some questions amongst not just the, the pundits in the media, but even scholars and lawyers on, well, is this something that should be looked at as well as a potential reform going forward? Yeah. And on this poll, you, know, you can see people still like the overall process. But the, the amazing thing to me was Republicans were super excited about it at, in the beginning, pre-election, but afterward, not so much, uh, whereas Democrats were happier after the results were in. So just just goes to show you about uh, <laughs> people like the outcomes of the race. All right. So what are we looking at in reforms? There's a few things kicking around. We'll show you some polls on some of the ideas that are being mentioned. Why don't we go to the next slide? The first one is whether recalls should just be limited to legitimate reasons, such as corruption or criminal acts. People seem to really like that idea. Um, as we listed the reasons for the Newsom recall, none of those things fit into that category. And so one of the proposals is they have to be what they would define as real legitimate reasons. People like that. Uh, the other one has to do with increasing the number of signatures. Uh, Rob, why don't you talk about that for a second? Yeah, so th this, is, this is probably the most practical uh, reform. As I'd mentioned earlier, California has the, the easiest or most liberal recall laws in any state constitution among states that allow for this. Just 12% of the votes cast in the last gubernatorial uh, election. So if you raise that threshold, you know, as is suggested here, even up to 20%, the cost of doing that, the paid signatures that were, is really why this one qualified. The, the cost would have been millions of dollars more. And it, you know, maybe they still would have done it, but it would have cost them a lot more money. My guess is they wouldn't have made it, wouldn't have been able to get it done in time because it would have forced them to go just beyond Republican voters to get those signatures, which is what they largely focused on. So this reform you can see has support, although that's not huge support because this would have to be approved by the voters to amend the constitution. But you're starting to see the, the, the way people are thinking about maybe what should be what should be done on this. Yeah. And uh, we're going to throw you, uh, three slides at you from a poll that just came out uh, two days ago. Uh, next slide. This is another reform. Now, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, the governor is not even on the other side of the ballot when you're casting these things. Is that fair? And one of the ideas is to put him or her on the other side of the ballot as well. Uh, again, this is something that uh, seems to be something that people like a little more than some other ideas. Um, we'll see how that plays out. Again, as Rob just mentioned, this has to be uh, put on the ballot by the legislature or through some kind of citizen initiative. Next slide. This is the limits on recall reasons that we just talked about. Again, enjoy some popularity. And the next one. And this is what Rob just talked about, raising signature requirements. You see Republicans really don't like this. I think by and large, Rob might agree with this because this has been their tool to qualify a recall. I, I agree, although, you know, it's uh, ironically, I, I advise Republicans that they really should be interested in these types of reforms, because if a Republican were to ever get elected governor in a general election, they most certainly would face a recall uh, almost immediately. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, one more. These are some of the actual proposals that are being considered in the legislature right now. There's a couple bills. Uh, the chairs of both the Senate Assembly Committees on Elections have committed to doing something in the next year. Um, a couple that we haven't talked about. Uh, one would allow people that are on as a target of recall to actually get that list of signatures to that recall. Right now, they can't do that. Uh, in, in school board and state Senate races, this might be more important because you could actually see who's signing that list and try to dissuade them. There's also a period of time, I think it's only a week or two right now, that you can remove your signature from the petition. Um, there was an actual effort to try to do this with the Newsom folks, but uh, that went nowhere. It's largely considered a waste of time, but it's a, such a short period that there's some thought they should be lengthening in that. The other thing is getting on the ballot. You know, we had, I forget what the number was, Rob, 400 plus candidates in 2003. It was much lower this time around. I think largely spurred because the legislature passed the law saying you had to uh, 
uh, provide your income tax returns to be a candidate that got thrown out in court, but it was something that I think limited the number of candidates at the time. Uh, so there's some thought of raising the filing fee and the voter signature threshold that's now in place for that. Um, we talked about allowing the office holder to be on the other side of the ballot and somebody else had the wild idea of, of uh, allowing the lieutenant governor to succeed if a governor's recalled rather than having that second question altogether. Uh, the current lieutenant governor was not too excited about that. So I don't think that's going to go anywhere. So the, by the way, there are several, several other states where that is the procedure. If you recall the governor, then the lieutenant governor just becomes governor. All righty. Well, the bad news is we get to do this election all over again in uh, just about a year from now. Uh, next slide, please. The, the governor, one of the main arguments against this recall was Gavin Newsom's going to be on the ballot in June of 2022 and also probably November of 2022. So why did we spend all this money? Well, to be continued, as they say, we'll, we'll have the opportunity to weigh on Gavin Newsom in less than one year from today. Any closing comments there, Rob? Well, just just that'll be you know be interesting heading into next year. I mean, he's got to be a bit exhausted, which maybe why he took that break a couple of weeks ago and skipped that trip to Glasgow. But uh, what an exhausting year to have to govern through COVID, but then also then face this recall, and then heading into next year to me what will be interesting. Will be he was so successful in the recall, essentially replicating the numbers that he won with and in 2018, that if he doesn't now meet that bar again next year, you know, will that uh, expedite the lame duck status in a, in a second term? All remains to be seen, but those are the, those are the type of things that insiders in Sacramento are keeping an eye on. Absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'll turn it over to Ruth for the Q and A. Hi, it's Ruth Ann. Thank you, Rob and Steven. Um, and yes, indeed, there are a few questions. One of them, um, has several parts relating to cost. Um, for example, I think it came out recently, what was the cost of the election? I don't know, and perhaps you could share that number. This was also done as a special election. I don't know if there are any discussions about making sure a recall always be, com be combined with a general election as a cost-saving measure. And a third question is, so how much does a typical signature gatherer for petitions get paid? Well, I'll start with the, I'll start with the bottom one, Rob. You can take the top ones. Okay. okay. Signature gatherers, it's a cartel of companies that organize the signature gathering process. And it really depends on how fast you need those signatures and how, how difficult it is to get those signatures. Um, they've been paid a little as a buck lately to Jerry Brown's uh, ballot measure that he had to get on the ballot in a ridiculously short amount of time. They were paying $6.50 a signature. So it really varies depending on election to election and issue to issue. Go ahead. So the cost of the recall was somewhere between $250, $300 million. One of the reasons it's so expensive is because it was still COVID and they mandated that they do this as an all vote by mail election. So you have substantial uh, printing costs, which by the way, now since then, the legislature has decided that's how we're going to do elections going forward, period. So no, there really hasn't been discussion about consolidating uh, this with the general election. In this instance, it would have been duplicative or you know, taken away the point of of having the, the recall this year and what the petition was seeking to do. Uh, there is, you know, I, there, there, there could be, I, there could be some reform as you can't, you know, have it within 12 months possibly of a general election that could, you know, just invalidate it. But, you know, the cost of these things, we pay for democracy. And in California, we have a, you know, a right to do these, these things. And uh, the legislature is actually bound uh, to, to fund them. And interestingly, the cost argument, which was used a lot 18 years ago and was used again this year, ultimately doesn't really resonate with voters. They might be bothered by it, um, but people like the right to vote and they, they value it, which is one of the reasons why they're still for the recall process being in place. They just maybe want it reformed a bit. So on the question of reform, 
uh, two questions we have. One is, is there any stirrings of either a regional or statewide petition to change the recall process? And related to that, um, I think you said there were, we were one of 19 states that had a recall process. Is there another state or two which you think does it better that could be a, a roadmap for how to improve our process? Well, I'll jump in first. I think if you see reforms that won't come through petitions, um, it will be put on the ballot by the legislature, the Democrat supermajority in the legislature. Um, Senator Glazer and I believe it's Assemblyman Berman are the, the, the chairs of their respective houses elections committees and they've already had a hearing on this and I think you'll see legislation from them uh, probably working jointly here shortly and you know, when they reconvene in, in January. What would have to happen is the legislature would have to pass a constitutional amendment on, with these reforms by a two-thirds vote. It would then go on the ballot. I, you know, probably they'll do this in time to be on the ballot next November if they do anything. In terms of other states, I mean, you know, as we've referenced generically, most states have a higher threshold of required signatures. Some require, you know, some allow for the lieutenant governor to succeed uh, into office. I was involved in a potential recall of uh, an Alaska governor, and that was that was the remedy. You recall the governor, and the lieutenant governor be, becomes governor. So there's things we can look to, I think, in other states, but no one has the experience. 19 states may have the ability to do it, but as Steve you know, showed earlier, it's only happened four times, and two of those four were here in California. So other states are somewhat untested in this territory. Yeah, and I think you know Democrats are going to be loath to do anything that makes it any easier for a recall to happen because they're in power. They don't want the recalls to happen. So I don't think you're going to see any massive reforms other than making it more difficult to, to recall someone. Um, I know for sure that the little Hoover Commission held some hearings last week, and our Secretary of State Shirley Weber had some ideas. But you know they're still in the idea stage and. It's a, it's a high hurdle to get something approved by the voters. The reason that it can't be done by initiative is somebody would have to fork over 6 million bucks plus to put it on the ballot. And I don't think there's, well, there might be one or two do-gooders out there, maybe Charles Munger or somebody who did the top two primary reform uh, that might have that kind of money to put something on the ballot, but I think we're gonna see it coming out of the legislature. So here's another question, a little bit broader than the recall one. Um, the question relates to what is the future of the Republican Party within California? Well, the future of the Republican Party uh, will depend on whether they can grow from their super minority status to be something that can be more competitive. Uh, you know, the, the party has shrunk here largely through demographics. One way to think of it is that for every one Republican that was registered in the last 18 years since the 03 recall, there's been 10 Democrats that were registered. Also, a lot of the out-migration from the state has been disproportionately Republican. So just as there are Southern states are that are becoming more Republican over the last several decades, California has just become more, more Democrat. Uh, the, you know, we're, we're watching right now the decennial redrawing of, of districts for Congress and the legislature you know, possibly there could be some seats that are, allow Republicans to be a bit more competitive, but from a statewide basis, it's very hard uh, to see how they overcome the math problem that they that they have of being outnumbered. Yeah, and you know, you don't often hear this from a Democrat, but I personally would like to see a stronger Republican Party. There was, the Democrats are now fighting about, you know, who can be more socialist or who can be more moderate rather than fighting Republicans. And you know the, the two thirds majority means essentially you can ignore the Republican input on a lot of things. And that's leaving large parts of our state out. It's leaving large constituencies, agriculture, for example, out of the equation. And I don't think it leads to a real healthy government when you have one party just dominating almost every level, all constitutional officers, both the governorship and, and the legislature, it's just not healthy. So one of the things you mentioned as a possible reform was, if I have it straight, putting um, the recall candidate or the, the official subject to recall on the other side of the ballot. What exactly does that translate to? What, what would that mean? Well, it would mean somebody 
you know, could still, you could, you could be recalled, but then be replaced by somebody with like in a gubernatorial election, as little as probably 10% of the vote, you know, and that's dangerous. Like, for example, Newsom could have got 49% of the vote and been replaced by Larry Elder, who got 18% of the vote. So the idea is to put the person as the subject of the recall on both sides of the ballot, literally. So you'd have a choice that whoever got the most votes as a candidate would win. And it'd be an odd situation to get recalled and also win the other part. But a lot of people see that as being fair. So I don't related think that's to fly. Okay. Related to that is our last question where um, someone's asked you to, again, clarify why having a Democrat on the ballot would have hurt Newsom's chances. Sure. So good, good question. It's worth clarifying and spending a moment on. So if a Democrat had run, uh, Democrats that were dissatisfied with Newsom, and, you know, as Steve indicated, there, there may have been quite a few in the polling suggested. In fact, there was one poll in the middle of the recall that asked, would you want uh, you know, more choice, you know, like Newsom, or do you want more choices in, in for next year in 22? And a uh, majority of Democrats said, well, well, I would take a look at someone else, you know, they're well in the shop. So you give, you know, you give some, them the, the ability to, to shop, um, it could have jeopardized the governor. There's some theory, and this is a much d- great debate, which I'm sure Steve will, might want to weigh in on, that back in 03, because Cruz Bustamante, the sitting lieutenant governor, a Democrat, was on the ballot, it gave Democrats some permission to recall Gray Davis and then vote for him, and that it therefore hurt Davis on the recall question. So that's why it was a it was a strategic imperative for Newsom to make sure no well-known uh, viable Democrat was on the ballot. Yeah, and and for messaging purposes, it's just a lot easier to say no than. Yeah. And having somebody else saying, vote for me over here, I'm a Democrat, as yeah. the YouTube star tried to do. Um, the, the Newsom campaign could just focus on him instead of worrying about somebody else. Thank you. Chris, I think it's back to you. OK, well, thank you both for all your um, insights today. Uh, we do want to let you know uh, that as a small thank you, we'd like to offer both of you an honorary membership in the Renaissance Society. And we'll also be making a donation in your name to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund. So thank you both for that. Thank, thank you. you. So today's presentation was recorded. You'll be able to view it in a few days by going to our YouTube channel or click on the link from the Renaissance website. And next week, we have an interesting forum. Uh, Dr. Konsu Burke from the UC Davis Department of Design is breaking barriers by developing extraordinary designs in wearable reactive clothing for people with disabilities or for improving pain management from chronic diseases. This clothing senses changes in people's emotions, such as anxiety and or physiological conditions. Her focus is on how can we improve the quality of our lives through innovative functional clothing design. That's going to be very interesting. So I hope you'll join us next week. And thanks for joining us today. We'll see you then.